But this time, genuinely for real, this is the end of it. This is Solo Only, a character that can't interact with other players. No parties, no market board, no NPC support, just Solo, his trusty axe bill, and the many minions we found along the way. For the past 200 hours, we've clawed our way through some of the toughest challenges this game can offer. Some that most people didn't even think were possible. But against all odds, we've made it here, to the end of 2.0. Day 1 starts our gear grind. With the biggest chunk of our crafting finished, and our Woot's armor pieces obtained, it was time to finish our planned gear. I put together a list of all the items I needed to craft before before the day was done so we'd be ready to take on Castro. Three pieces of armor, five new accessories, and the four masterwork books I hadn't gotten yet. Our Wolfram gear needed a material called Terminus Putty, which was locked behind the Alchemist masterwork recipes. So first thing on the list is a growth formula Delta Concentrate. The main ingredient we needed, Trillium Bulbs, wasn't available just yet, so we needed to fill the time with something else. On the other hand, we have plenty of Rose Gold, so we actually start the day off by crafting our new accessories. Hippogriff Leather, some Umbral Rocks, Basilisk Eggs, Cobalt Ore, Copper Ore, and Wind Crystals, or Basilisk whetstones, and rose gold nuggets. To craft our accessories, we needed more clusters, which wouldn't be up for a while, so we took a quick detour for another item on the list. For our culinarian masterworks, we needed a sautéed coral, so we grabbed some coral meat while waiting. The sautéed coral needed another timed node, the volcanic rock salt, so we're back to waiting. Shortly after, we grabbed our wind clusters, bought the lime sulfur for our alchemist item, crafted a rose gold earring and rose gold necklace, mined some fancy rock salt, and made our sautéed coral. Trading in the coral gets us our first masterwork unlock of the day, culinarian. With a new masterwork on Unlocked, the main recipe for upgrades was a spicy tomato relish, which we had most of the ingredients for already. We run off to grab some noble grapes and cinnamon for dark vinegar and a spicy relish. After all these distractions, our trillium bulbs were finally available. Checking in with Talon, we needed five tomato relish to upgrade our gear, so we put that off to the side for now. We mined some cinnabar for quicksilver, a spruce lumber, some dark steel nuggets, and a new offhand for my alchemist to make our high quality growth formula delta concentrate. And with that, we've got our second masterwork book for the day. After remembering our accessories, we make a rose gold bracelet and two rose gold rings. That finishes off most of our crafting checklist, so next up is our armor. Trading in our fragrant logs and umbral rocks for forager hats, and our hats for grand company seals, we buy two filtered water and six tawny latex to make our terminus putty, but as per usual, I don't have the craftsmanship to make it, so we need some gear upgrades. For the best alchemist tool, we need spirits of salt to trade with talon. Spirits of salt require vitriol, an uncraftable item, so we unlock the cobalt beast tribe and buy it from their merchant. Vitriol in hand, we grab some lightning shards, fire clusters, noble grapes, and cinnamon to make four more spicy relish, and five spirits of salt for our new alchemist and culinarian tools. Fate fail? <laughs> what did I do? And with our new alchemist tool, the terminus putty for our armor was finished. For the rest of the materials, we needed a lot of Grand Company seals. 7,500 to be exact. Caracal for fleece and black alumen to make undyed woolen threads, threads into cloth, hippogriff leather, more forager gear from Talon, and 17 militia duckbills to trade in for 7,100 seals. One quick rose gold bracelet later, we had 7,500, just enough to get five shellite. We meld our gear so we don't need to use food for our crafting, turn the shellite into wool from ingots, make some dark steel nuggets for dark steel rings and plates, and some hippogriff leather to make our heavy wool from helmet, chest, and pants. At long last, the armor we needed to clear Castrum was done. Our new gear got us over 6,000 health and plenty of better substats to make the black eft much more manageable. The last thing on our Castrum checklist, aside from completionist masterwork books, was a new food buff, Popoto Pancakes. Mirror apples, nutmeg, sunset wheat, apkalo eggs, and wheat flour to make Popoto Pancakes. Upgrades finished and Silence Echo turned on, we're finally back in Castro. Wait, no, hold on. Fragrant logs? We're gonna have to get out of here, gamers. It's been a while since we last visited this place, so let's do a quick recap. Previously, the pools of enemies were so overpowering that we had to single target to keep ourselves alive, but with our new stats, we could use AoEs to kill them quicker. Uh, you know, at least we managed to do it once. And no wonder, because chat pointed out that I still had my old armor on. With our proper armor on, the second group died a lot faster. After four groups of enemies, we're back to the black. Eft. The most powerful boss we faced yet, even with our gear upgrades, I wasn't sure we could win. The only thing that makes the Black Eft difficult are its adds. Starting the fight with four adds total, two magic and two melee, 30 seconds into the fight, it spawns another three magic and three melee. Ten adds to deal with and AoEs to heal through, this wasn't even the worst part. Further into the fight, he spawns two colossi, hard hitting adds with a bigger health pool. And then if you manage to survive all that, he summons two more colossi, melee, and magic adds. Four total waves of enemies to deal with, this fight was more like a marathon than a battle. But this time around, we had a trick up our sleeve. Since the Black Eft starts with adds, we could attack one of them from range, pull it out of the arena,
arena and build up our beast gauge before starting the fight. With 100 beast gauge and our damage buff, Surging Tempest, we'd be starting the fight with a huge amount of damage stored up and ready for whenever we needed it. The plan was to save all of that damage until the first adds spawn and then burst down the mages as fast as possible. This strat was going so well, the only mitigation we had to use was arm's length to slow down the melee. We were consistently reaching the final ad phase, but by the time I got there, we had nothing left to heal back up with. Our last resort was another new strat, using an X potion first as early as possible to make sure our max potion was off cooldown by the time the Colossi spawned. This pushed us the furthest we had ever gotten, taking down both of the final mages, but it still wasn't enough. As we were using the best crafted gear we could make, we had to start looking outside of the crafting log. After some unlucky materia gambling at Mutamix, we needed a new plan. The last craftable upgrade we could make was a Tremor Axe, but it was incredibly unlikely. To make a Tremor Axe, we needed a Cragheart, a rare material from Titan EX. The only chance we had to get it was desynthing our Scholar Book, which relied on Alchemist desynths. If you didn't know, Alchemist is one of the worst classes to get desynth levels for. None of the potions could be desynthed, so we had to make complex weapon recipes for every point. And we were looking at up upwards of 95 crafts to get an okay chance at the Cragheart. After a bit of searching, we decided to try using Wand of Gales, which needed an Eye of Wind and a Growth Formula Gamma. After 20 minutes of killing Ked Traps, we had two blue Land Trap leaves, got some Wind Rocks for Eyes of Wind, Cinnabar, Rock Salt, and a Rosewood Branch to make Growth Formula Gamma and a Wand of Gales. With how low our Desynth level was, the first Desynth got us 3.6 and a total of 15 points. The next gave us another 3, and then immediately dropped off to 1.8. Three Wands later, we were stuck around one skill gain per Desynth, which would mean a minimum of 70 more crafts before we had our improved chance for a Cragheart. We still had a chance at low Desynth, just not a very good one. So we decided to take the gamble and lost. We didn't get the Cragheart, but at least I got the subscribe button. That may have been our only chance at a craftable upgrade, but we still had other options. The Allied Seal Vendor at the Grand Company had a selection of unobtainable gear we could use to boost our stats. I wanted to keep this to a minimum though, so we went with upgrades for our weakest pieces, our accessories. From eye level 70 to 110, a mixture of Noct and Glom accessories gets us another 700 health and even better substats. We took a quick break from theory crafting with a map, and it was time to return to Castrum. Oh, and a quick tip, if you ever want to get rid of the alarms in Castrum, just mute your ambient sounds. All of the trash mobs down, we're back at the Black F. After a few failed attempts, we had our best run yet, but with only two adds left alive, the boss finished us off with his ranged attacks before we could heal, and our next attempt met the same fate. To finish things off, there was one more upgrade we could get. All of our palace grinding had gotten us enough tombstones of poetics to get an eye level 130 weapon. The only equivalent to that was unobtainable as we would have to clear the binding coils of Bahamut. Just in case you were wondering what the difference is, that is 34 vitality. It is a six physical damage boost, and that's 32 strength. What do you mean poor Bill? It's still Bill. Bill has just devoured their stats. But even with the new axe, this was nowhere close to easy. We had everything we needed. We were so close to victory. Now all that was left was getting a perfect run. That was it. That was the one I need to live. Okay. I got it. We're good. And we're on boss. That's done. Oh, please be a victory lap. To have a potent poisoning potion. I can't deal with you right now, Black After This needs to be it. This seemed like it was it, but we couldn't relax just yet since I didn't know the rest of the fight. It's, uh, it's handed to me on a silver platter at this point. Like, the fight is done, but I am still so ridiculously nervous. There's, in the back of my mind, there's just the thought of what if he summons another set of ads? <laughs> what am I gonna do? Oh, first boss down! After over a month of preparing to fight one boss, it was finally over. The Black Eft was defeated, and we could see the rest of the dungeon. Now, just like Stone Vigil, we were on a timer. I had 66 minutes to get through all of the ads in this dungeon and beat two more bosses, or I would be starting right back at the beginning. After three more ad pulls and dodging AoEs, we were at the second boss, the Magitek Vanguard F1. A much simpler boss than the Black Eft. The Vanguard boils down to move away from the distance-based damage, dodge some big flashy AoEs, some normal AoEs, and survive a tank buster. So he went down pretty easy. Warrior number one, yeah, get me out of here. You know, you might have scared me a bit ago, but now this is just cathartic. With 48 minutes left on instance, we make it to the final boss. In the past, Livia Sas Junius would have been a juggling act of managing missiles and Magitek claws. I had never seen the new Livia, so we were going in blind and hoping it was doable. Her first real attack sets the stage for the entire fight. Constant, arena-scale AoEs keeping you moving at all times. Aside from her tank buster, Aglaia Climb, there wasn't much direct damage we had to heal through. Oh, she talked. What is with all of these? What 
you. I was not paying enough attention. This is a dungeon boss? Are you kidding me? At 20%, Livia changes things up. She gives herself a damage up and starts casting raid-wide AoE damage from the center. And she'll use artificial plasma four times in a row before having to cast it again. Oh, is this it? She doesn't get continuous damage ups, she just starts spamming the plasmas. Funny enough, this meant that getting her to 20% was the same as killing her. The damage was negligible, cast times were long, and we had more than enough healing to finish things off. You guys had me worried that she was gonna be like Shiva and start stacking up damage ups. Okay. If anything, this is easier than the rest of the fight. Castrum is out! We did it! It's finally done, dude! We're free! Playtime of 7 days, 9 hours, and 50 minutes. So it's taken 34 hours to get through Castrum. From the field craft not even considering everything else. And we are finally on the last quest of 2.0, the ultimate weapon. With Praetorium unlocked, there were just two instances left between us and the end of 2.0. For now, it's time to see what we're up against. Starting with level sync, the group of mobs were just as bad as Castro. Four to five enemies that I had to slowly take down with single target attacks to get my storm's path healed. The beginning was an endurance test. For every group of enemies we defeated, there was another stronger group just around the corner. With the final Magitex defeated, it had taken 15 minutes to reach the first boss. Even as a solo, you can't skip the cutscenes, so we'd get to watch them every time we had to reattempt the dungeon. First of many cutscenes finished, we're on to the first boss, the Magitek Colossus. With heavy hitting auto attacks dealing 500 damage, followed by an AoE that hit for 700, we were on the back foot from the very beginning of the fight. Our only reprieve was when he started using his casts. His first was Prototype Laser Alpha, a slow casted, easily dodgeable attack that left a lot of time for us to get hits in once I was used to it. Immediately after is Prototype Laser Beta, an AoE targeted at every party member that does the same damage as his first AoE, Ceruleum Vent. From there, he casts Ceruleum Vent again, Prototype Laser Alpha, and Grand Sword, the easiest cast to dodge and our main time to heal up. With plenty of cast to heal during, the Colossus went down on the first try. The next section was quick and easy since we didn't really have to fight anything, and we're on to the next boss, Nero Tulskeva. This was the first boss we'd face that used a party stack, where all four players group up to reduce damage. Since I was solo, even with mitigation, this hit for almost 2,000 damage. Half of my health gone in just one attack. Occasionally, he'll summon a Magitek Deathclaw somewhere in the arena. If the Deathclaw reaches you, it uses a knockback to hit you into the electricity outside the arena, dealing damage over time even when you step out of it, and at the same time, you have to dodge a massive Konal AoE from Nero. The only positive we had was being able to run away from Nero's tank buster to delay the hit, but it still did 1,000 damage when it eventually caught up. After one more run to learn his mechanics, we'd seen enough of Praetorium for now. This was just a victory lap after all. A roller coaster of ups and downs, this was only the beginning, and it was also the end of day one. The next day wasn't streamed and was a bunch of Palace of the Dead to level my warrior. Level 57, 58, 59, and 3 hours later, level 60, our grind was done. Day 2 starts and our goal is to finish all of the crafting we left undone on day 1. We still had the first masterwork books from Carpenter and Leatherworker to get, and a new, much more painful goal before we could take on Praetorium. We needed better food, which meant getting Masterwork 2 for my Culinarian, meeting 2 more Fieldcraft Demi Materia 3. We kill Caracal for Fleece, Hippogriffs for Skins, and then take a quick break after remembering I had a Cursed Horde from the palace grind. Alongside the warrior floors, I had done another 10 floors on my summoner run, so we've got 14 iron sacks and 2 golds to open. A few chances at woots from the iron sacks didn't turn into anything good, and from our gold sacks we got an entire new class to use. Though it isn't currently that useful, we could now use samurai without having to get ironworks gear. Oh, and some monk weapons. Turning the Mog Fist into Demi Materia, it was time to get back to the Seal Grind. Black Alumin, Lightning Shards, and Wind Crystals makes our Woolen Yarn, Undyed Cloth, Hippogriff Leather, and Militia Duckbills. 12 Duckbills gets us to 7,500 Seals, which is enough for 4 attempts at our Fieldcraft 3s. Astral Eyes and Aqueous Whetstones for Radiant Astral Eyes, and some Rose Gold Nuggets to make an Astrolobe Clinometer our best known chance to get Fieldcraft 3s. Our first Desynth got us the Astral Eye back, and after grabbing some Copper Ore for more Rose Nuggets, we get one of the two Fieldcrafts we needed. 4 attempts later, we run out of Grand company seals, so it's time for more hippogriffs. For the next two hours, we go back and forth, crafting more clinometers, descenting for rose gold nuggets, and killing more hippogriffs until we finally get the last field craft. With both field crafts in hand, it's time to get our masterwork book. Table salt, noble grapes, dark vinegar, and spicy tomato relish to make a high quality rich tomato relish, and with that, the culinarian masterwork 2 recipes are unlocked. Now we just needed better gear so we could actually craft the things, which means a lot more Grand Company seals for a new offhand. 
After spending some time melding our gear, we had enough control to craft everything, but still needed more craftsmanship, even with our food buff. In a desperate attempt to avoid more grand company grinding, we find a new food. Sharkfin soup should give us all the craftsmanship we need, so it's time for some fishing. After catching our megalodon, we grabbed some star anise from the quartermaster to make the soup. But before making our combat food, we still had two masterwork books to get. Thankfully, ones that didn't require demi material. We use animal fat to make a hard hippogriff leather, and hardened sap and spruce lumber for just for once. Can I have the stats beforehand? How many gear upgrades do we need, dude? Silver shark, shark oil, dark steel, claw hammer, treated spruce lumber. With that, we've unlocked the masterwork one books for every crafting class. To finish things off, it's time to make our new combat food. Oh, come on. Right, so the shark fin soup didn't actually get us any more craftsmanship, so we had to make the artisan's culinary knife. I was going to go insane if I had to see another hippogriff, so we took a different option for our grand company seals. We grabbed fragrant logs and umbral rocks, killed all goats for horn glue to make spruce plywood, and traded them all into talon for forager gear and artisan gear. But we were going to need way more than the 3,000 seals that got us. I made some rose gold cogs with the spare nuggets we had before remembering another option. I still hadn't finished my grand company hunting log, so we could get some extra seals from going into Wanderer's Palace. Level sync turned on, we had much better gear from the last time we tried this, so this would also be a great chance to get our revenge and clear the dungeon. Slowly but surely, while dodging the Tonberry Stalker, our gear was strong enough now that we could clear all of the ads. After killing the Tonberry that had kept us from progressing for so long, we were at the first boss, the Keeper of Halidom. The Keeper is a pretty simple boss. Occasionally, it will sneeze, giving you a debuff that reduces your magic defense. The only other mechanic is Inhale, a conal AoE that ends with a second AoE that poisons anyone near the boss. So long as you run away from the boss when it casts Inhale, you'll dodge the poison. Without any dangerous attacks, the Keeper goes down on the first try. In the next area, we complete a hunting log entry for 1500 seals before moving on. A bit further down, we make it to the Endless Rise, the largest room in the dungeon with Tonberry Stalkers patrolling the paths. Luckily for us, the last two hunting log targets were found in this room. Soldiers of Nim for 1600, Corrupted Nimians for 1500, and completing the log for an extra 3600 seals. To make our artisan knife, we needed 14,000, and with the hunting log done, we just needed 3,000 more. The achievement for the hunting log also got us a new little buddy. Alright chat, what are we gonna name him? Zuko? He's our little prince from the Fire Nation. I like that. Finishing the hunting log didn't mean we were done with the dungeon, so we're on to the second boss. The giant Bavois was a much more dangerous enemy than the Keeper. The boss itself is easy. So long as you walk behind it while it casts fire, it won't actually hit you with it. The problem is the ads. The three colored bavois give paralysis and heavy for 30 seconds, making it much more difficult to dodge the fire cap. And later in the fight, there's a blue bavois that spawns that can heal the boss. After a few close calls, the boss goes down and we're on to the end of the dungeon to face off against the Tonberry King. The main mechanic for the king is the little Tonberries that spawn throughout the fight. Every time one is killed, the king gets a stack of rancor. Then, every so often, he'll cast everybody's grudge, which deals more damage for every stack of rancor he has. He was dealing massive damage, but our one saving grace was how slow the king moved. Rather than having to sprint, we could just walk away from the boss and keep it out of auto attack range. The other boon was staying away from the Tonberry. Berries. If we didn't kill them, he wouldn't do increased damage from everybody's grudge. But there was one flaw in our plan. When you're far away from the king, he has a chance to cast Scourge of Nim, a fast-hitting ranged attack that also gives you heavy, so you can't run from the boss. Our next run, we made it all the way to the final ads, the Tonberry Slasher. For this whole fight, the boss barely used Scourge of Nim, but then, out of nowhere, he hit me with four at the same time, dealing 3,000 damage. That was absolutely unlivable, and seemingly completely random. There were no tells, I didn't do anything different, he just decided it was time for me to die. We gave it a few more attempts, but never got close to that run again, and decided to get back to the seal grind. Turning in all of our dungeon drops, we had just under 13,000 seals. So we needed one more quick hardening sealant to finish our gear, and trading in the gold cogs I made earlier got us just enough. After welcoming some new minions to the team, we kill some buffalo for night milk, grab some wheat, make a treated spruce lumber, wool from ingot, and basilisk whetstone to craft our artisan's culinary knife, and with that, we can finally make our new combat food, bacon bread. Bread finished, it had been a long day of progress, so this was the end of day two. Climbing out of bed anxious for the day ahead, our sights were set on a Praetorium clear. We warm up with a quick map to start off the day, but there were no other distractions. It was time to face Praetorium. Our first attempt for the day was level synced, as I wanted to try and defeat Nero on level before moving on. After another 20 minutes of killing the mobs throughout the dungeon, we're back at the Colossus, and five short minutes later, the first boss is down. Now it was time for our main goal of this run, taking down Nero Tolskeva. At first, our strategy was to avoid the Deathclaw by running for as long as possible, as that would also help with dodging his tank busters. But we 
we couldn't get enough healing since we were too far away to attack the boss. Our next attempts tried to kill the death claw with tomahawks while keeping up attacks on the boss, but that didn't end up working either. After all this, the furthest we had gotten Nero was 80%. Even if we had been able to take on Nero, the final fight wasn't going to be possible synced, so we stepped out and swapped our level sync for Silence Echo. Running through the dungeon once again, we enjoyed another round of cutscenes and made it back to the second boss. Mitigation on and some misplaced confidence, Nero stacks an auto attack with his tank buster and does 2400 damage in a split second. The entire fight, it was a constant struggle to keep my health just above that line of instant death. But after being much safer with my mitigations, on the second attempt, Nero Tulskeva goes down. With Nero down, all that's left is one more cutscene and an elevator ride. No, give me the glib back. How very glib, come on. And so, we're at the final boss of Praetorium, Gaius von Belsar. Every fight we have ever done, every struggle we have faced, every challenge we've overcome is just a joke compared to Gaius. All because of one mechanic. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The fight starts easy with some big X's called Terminus Est. After a short delay, they dash forward, dealing damage to anything in front of them. Next, he'll clone himself along the north wall and make some more Terminus Est. In this early phase, the biggest threats are Innocence, a tank buster that hits for 1300 through mitigation, and Festina, a four-person stack that deals 2,000 through mitigation. In his last attack, Ductus spawns a set of cascading AoEs that cover the entire arena. All of that seemed fine, though. Damage was rough, but so long as I could properly manage my mitigations and heals, we could deal with it. That is, until around 15%, when Gaius starts his final mechanic. He splits himself into four phantoms one in each corner of the room. Gaius becomes untargetable and starts charging one last attack. If I couldn't kill all four phantoms before he charged up to 100%, I would die. This was the first real DPS check we had ever faced, and the sole reason that no boss we had fought before could compare. With 26% left on the last phantom, our first run is at an end. Going in for our second attempt, we needed a plan. First, we needed to know exactly when Gaius was going to enter this DPS phase. Once we had that down, we would line up our combo so we could start with our highest damaging attack Storm's Path, have a full 60 second buff from Storm's Eye, and use Berserk before he entered so we could use it twice rather than just once. And to save precious seconds, I needed to be walking towards the next phantom as my current target was dying. Second phantom down, two left. I misjudged the damage I would deal and had to waste a GCD on the third phantom, and that mistake proved to be fatal. Come on, no dude, no, one hit! One hit, man! Oh, oh that hurt. And things only got worse. No! That was- I started the- oh, Come on, I had it, dude! It used by in the beast! Come on! No! Half a second! Half a second! Dude, we kept running into the same problem. If we lose it, it was because of that 0.5. Yeah, we lost to the 0.5. Okay. All right. Yet another death to Venividivici, we needed something to make this more consistent. And so, stepping out of Praetorium, we had some work to do. We, oh, thank you, the, the summoning circle returns, I'm back. There were two items I had been hesitant to get, as it would mean running through Praetorium again, but it didn't seem like something we could do without. The first was Potent Poisoning Potion, an alchemist potion that does damage over time to whatever your target is up to level 50, and has a separate cooldown from health potions, meaning I could safely use it while still healing. The second was something much more risky. An X Potion of Strength would increase the damage we do for a few seconds, but unlike the poisoning potions, this shared a cooldown with my health potion. Using one meant I couldn't use healing potions for five minutes, so if there was another tank buster or party sack after the DPS check, we had no way of healing through and would likely die. But so long as we could finish the fight, it was a risk I was willing to take. One of the ingredients, Thavdarian Mistletoe, was a timed node, meaning we had to wait for it to appear later in the day. In the meantime, we start a fishing trip for some shark oil. Heading over to the Isles of Umbra, we catch a large mouth or goby and use it as bait to catch a silver shark. And then, with the extra hammerheads that I kept in my saddlebag, we make our shark oil. The mistletoe wouldn't be up for a long time, so we decided to skip waiting and make the weaker mega potions of strength instead. Two wrong areas later, we've got our Sigoli Sage and our strength potions were made. Next were the poisoning potions. We pawn off an old knife for some seals, get pudding flesh, and cinnabar for quicksilver to make our potent poisoning potions. With a grand total of three strength pots and nine poisoning potions, it was time to face Gaius once again. You know the drill by now. Mobs, cutscene, Colossus, Gundam, cutscene, Nero, cutscene, and we're back to Gaius. First attempt back, muscle memory kicked in, and I used a potion right before the phantoms appeared. The poisoning potion on its own didn't make enough of a difference, and after failing to kill the first phantom before moving on, this was yet another death. The next attempt, I stood my ground, and after just barely managing to survive, we start the DPS check with a strength pot and poisoning potion. But again, I left too early and had to tomahawk on the way past the second phantom, and again for the third phantom. 
even with those two mess ups, this fight only lost by 6%. And so, once again, barely surviving to phantoms, I was confident. If I didn't make any mistakes here, we had more than enough damage to win. With one phantom left and Berserk guaranteeing max damage, there was no better chance than this. Come on. Good hit. Yes! Yes! Yes, dude! Yes! Okay! Okay! Ho oh, oh, ho! Oh. Do the rest of the fight! Do the rest of the fight! Oh, if this, if I die after this, I'm gonna lose my mind. My heart is beating out of my chest, dude. During the final phase, all Gaius does is auto attack and use his low damage AoE for it Abella. With that, Gaius von Belsar was defeated. Yes! Yes, dude! Oh my god. Oh wait, this is a this is a movable cut. I can skip this cutscene. I'm not gonna skip it. I feel like I deserve to enjoy this cutscene, actually. Praetorium was finished, and there was only one more fight to do. The Ultima Weapon. Porta Decamana unlocked. It's time to complete 2.0. Like the previous fights, I hadn't fought the Ultima Weapon after its update, so we were going in completely blind. Silence Echo turned on, it was time to see how far we could get. The Ultima Weapon makes use of all three primals we'd fought previously. The first phase is Titan. Starting off with Earth and Fury, he uses three main mechanics. Geo Crush, which deals more damage the closer you are to where Titan lands. Landslide, a high damage knockback that gets mirrored by Ultima after its cast. And Weight of the Land, which fills the arena with AoEs to dot. After Weight of the Land, the mechanics repeat. At 80%, Ultima uses Granite Internment, trapping us in a jail and dealing damage over time. We take a total of 2,000 damage before we're released from the jail and move on to the next phase. Second phase is Garuda and another big AoE. Garuda only has two mechanics. Eye of the Storm shrinks the size of the arena, and if you step out of the inner circle, you get flung into the center and take damage. While Eye of the Storm is up, she'll appear at a random cardinal and cast Wicked Wheel, forcing you to one side. At 60%, we get another transition cutscene, with Ultima becoming invincible through Vortex Barrier. Cutscene over, we're on to the third phase. Another AoE to add to our collection, the final primal is Ifrit. Radiant Plume creates a bunch of circles on the ground that you have to dodge, and Vulcan Burst is a knockback from the center of the arena. Vulcan Burst is paired with another set of Radiant Plumes, and at 35%, we get our last transition cutscene. With that, all of the primals are defeated, and we're on to the final phase of the Ultima weapon. All he does his auto attack, but since he doesn't have any casts to keep him occupied, he actually does a lot of damage this phase. And once you bring the boss down to 21%, the fight ends. Such devastation! This was this not, not my, my intention. intention. That first battle against Ultima was nothing more than a warm-up. Now we stood before the very end of 2.0, the true fight against the Ultima weapon. And unlike last phase, this would actually be difficult. Ultima starts things off with a Tank Buster, Homing Laser, that hits for 2,000 damage through mitigation, followed by Magitek Ray, a ground-targeted laser that explodes after a short period of time. The hitboxes for these are difficult to see, and much larger than they look. Homing Ray is an AoE that hits every party member, so the small gap of time while he's casting and the low damage dealt means it's a good chance for us to heal. Next is Etheric Boom, a knockback from Ultima that spawns four tethered orbs around the arena. And then they'll slowly start moving towards each other. Running into one of the orbs, causes it and its tethered partner to explode, dealing small amounts of damage, but if any of the orbs manage to touch in the center, they'll deal massive, unsurvivable damage. Laser Focus, another heavy hitting party stack, can deal over 3000 damage if I don't use mitigation. Another cast, Citadel Buster, is a line of nearly instant death that hits anything in front of the boss. Occasionally, Magitek turrets will be sent out in a variety of patterns, each shooting a damaging AoE in front of them. After the first attack, they readjust to a new pattern and fire again. Oh, and there's giant ships that fall from the sky. His last Last and longest cast is Tank Bird, a magic AoE that hits the whole party for low damage. With all of these heavy hitting attacks, the main struggle for this battle is managing our mitigations and healing to stay alive, which didn't go particularly well for our first time. First attempt finished, we step out of the instance to get some necessary items. There was one final gear upgrade I had been avoiding until now, a weapon we had earned a long time ago but hadn't ever used. Ultima was beyond what our gear could manage, so it's finally time. The Aetherpool gear we had earned from Palace of the Dead could be traded in to Iuna Kator for items called Aetherpool grips. If we traded 10 weapon and 10 armor levels, we could get one grip. Three of these grips can be traded in for a Pajali weapon, a level 60, I level 235 item, above and beyond anything we could obtain normally. A massive upgrade that on its own got us 500 health and a huge boost to our substats. So after grabbing a Glamour Prism, Bill gets himself some fancy new stats. Ten minutes in, the first phase goes down just as easily as before. Such devastation! This was not my intention! 
unlike our first attempt, we were just barely out healing the damage Ultima was dealing and made it to the final phase. At 30% health, the Ultima weapon jumps to the center of the arena and starts casting Ultima, the final DPS check. Before the cast was finished, the boss needed to die. 30% of the boss's health or instant death. From start to finish, the cast would take 1 minute and 14 seconds to kill me. For reference, I had taken around 8 minutes to deal 70% of Ultima's health, so I would need something like 3 to 4 minutes to kill him from 30%. But there was still hope. 30 seconds into the cast, we get the Blessing of Light, a buff that increases our damage by 3 times. And with that, we might just barely be able to push through. With 5 seconds left, we ended up just a little bit short. I almost just killed him as he casted it, dude. On that attempt, I had just been winging it. If I planned my damage properly, we should be able to finish this. And so we grind for the perfect run. But then, there was something wrong. Even with planning out my damage, we weren't getting close to where we were on the first run. So we decided to step out and get some more strength pots for the final phase. Silver Shark, Hefnerian Mistletoe, Lightning Shards, and Shark Oil to make an X potion of strength. With 6 potions and the gamer sending me off, it was time for more attempts. A strength potion paired with Berserk's guaranteed max damage got us an extra 700 per hit. But in the end, we lost to 0.2%. Once again, we were moments from victory. One GCD and it was over. We just needed to figure out what I had done differently on the first fight. And shortly after, we found it. On the first attempt, Ultima had started using Tank Purge as we got it below 30%. That extra 5 seconds let us start the phase at 28% instead of 30 which meant that for a real perfect run, we had to wait for Tank Purge before pushing to start the Ultima cast. Another attempt failed at 1%. After 3 hours of fighting Ultima, we stepped out to give our weapon the final upgrade from Jolly to Kenna. This meant giving up all of the Aetherpool gear I had earned until now, but if it could take down Ultima, it would be worth it. But then we lost again to 0.2%. 0.2, again, again, dude. Not the 0.2 again, I can't take it. With that heavy loss and only one strength potion left, we step out for a restock on food and potions. This time around, rather than using a tenacity food with bacon bread, we change things up and focus on damage. The other food option we had was Flint Caviar, a DPS food that increased my crit and direct hit. Since we had all the ingredients already, we throw together some bacon bread just in case we run out of caviar. We craft some strength pots, we just striped goby for an emperor fish, and grab some borax to make three Flint Caviar. One poisoning potion restock later, we head back in to Porta Decumana. As always, the first fight goes by quickly. After six hours of work from Praetorium to Ultima, I was exhausted, but this time felt different. And so we face off against our great enemy one more time. Okay, so I've done it a few times tonight. I, I've done it a bit, and I apologize for all of the fakeouts that we've had up to now. But this time, genuinely for real, this is the end of it. DPS food's going on immediately. I'm not using tenacity. It's all going to be damage. Thank you for stopping in, games. I'm closing chat for a bit. I will see you soon. Okay. That's the one. We've got a minute on it. I think this minute lasts us the rest of the fight. I save Inner Beast for when first buff comes. Quick inner beast to make sure that we're spread out.
20 seconds. Ten seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. That's it! That's it, dude! <laughs> okay! Oh my god, it's over! It's over! Ultimate weapon finished. The Ultima weapon was defeated, and there was just one last solo duty for us to complete. La Habrea, little did you know, I was a two-phase fight. Taking down La Habrea, the credits begin to roll, and we have finally cleared 2.0. And the ultimate weapon is complete. Flying is unlocked, dude. That's gonna make life so much easier. Before I ended the day though, the gamers had a surprise for me outside the Waking Sands. Earlier, we had mentioned doing a group photo, so I was excited to have a few folks huddled around for a picture. It's good to see you, gamer. What is the what is the thing that you wanted to say? Hello, Solo. I'm sure this long, strange journey has taken me to many corners of Eorzea and back. Crafted the most artisan gear known to man. Fought toe-to-toe -to -toe with primals alone, but know that despite your lonely endeavor, you have the support and back of my my fellow adventurers through and through, it is your honor to present to me the title fitting of his status, Warrior of Lonely Light. Thank you very much, gamers. I guess it's time for the it's time for the picture. <laughs> what is all this? There's so many people. Oh my god! There are so many of you. We take up the entirety of Vesper Bay. I'm, I'm really in tears. Um, I'll be completely honest. This is a bit of a mess though. Get me, get me out of here. I'm taking the balloons and I'm running. Rune will keep me safe. Oh wait, hold on, I can fly now. We could just be up here. Thank you very much, gamers. I couldn't have asked for anything more than this. We've got many more things to do for Solo, and many more things to do in Final Fantasy. Normally, I go to sleep, but I think it will be better to end it here. Here with everybody. I'm going to go eat food now. Goodbye.